Over the last year, speedrunner Judiwi would set 10 records across four different games in the Pokemon series, a feat very uncommon today as the Pokemon games have been speedrun and optimized for over a decade. But it turns out that Judiwi only accomplished this because he was cheating. Perhaps worst of all, he almost managed to steal $8,500 worth of bounties with his cheated records. So let's start by looking at the run that first raised suspicion and led to Judiwi's world of fake records to come crashing down. On November 17th, 2023, Judiwi was streaming attempts of Pokemon Sapphire Any% Percent Glitchless, a game he first completed a run in just 4 days previously with a time of 2 hours and 39 seconds. The run he was currently on had an even better pace, and when it finished, he had achieved a second place time that was 5 seconds off the current world record. If we look at Judiwi's timeline with the game, we see between his first run and second place time, only 4 days had passed, with another runner commenting that a 2 hour time is insane for a first attempt. Jadiwi replied that he had been practicing every split of the game for several days and was close to a 202 in his previous attempts, but that he struggled with the bike sections. Aside from these two runs and Discord comments, with only the second place run even having a video, there wasn't any other evidence of Jadiwi's progress with the game. While he did have history with other games in the series, his less than a week grind to second place didn't sit well with one person in particular the world record holder, Wave Warrior, and he set to work analyzing Jadiwi's run. Since Jadiwi admitted to having problems with the bike, this was one of the first things Wave Warrior checked. In particular, he scrutinized a trick that lets you skip spinner trainers called run to bikes. When you approach a spinner, they behave differently based on how you're moving. If you're walking or on the bike, they will pick a random direction to look every 32 frames. But if you're running, they will always look in the direction you're traveling when you enter their hearing radius, meaning a spinner will always catch you when running. This mechanic can be exploited to always pass a spinner provided you can execute the requirements fast enough. When a spinner picks a direction to look, they will remain stationary for 31 frames. On the 32nd, the random direction calculation is run again. This gives you a window of 31 frames to pass a spinner with zero risk of being caught. So players run into the hearing radius to force a certain direction, then get on the bike which takes 16 frames, start moving which is 8 frames, with each additional tile of movement being 4 frames. This sequence adds up to 28 frames, giving you a 6 frame window to come to a complete stop after running, as you can't mount the bike while moving. This is a very demanding trick, with top runners being able to pull it off more often than not. But when the 7 run to bikes in Jadiwi's run were analyzed, it turned out that none of them were safe. He was so late on one of them that the NPC turned before he was safely passed, and on a second, he did the movement wrong and continued traveling in its line of sight meaning had it turned, he would have been caught. This didn't look like the movement execution of a world record level runner, so Wave Warrior dug deeper into the run, this time analyzing the three manipulations that take place, and what he found didn't add up either. While this speedrun was beginning to look questionable, one thing you don't want to question is the factuality of your news, and this video's sponsor Ground News can help in that regard. Ground News is a platform and app I use to stay up to date on events around the world, with it combining articles from local and international sources in one place for easy access. Part of the reason I find this so useful is that it sources articles from across the political spectrum and displays which way a particular source leans. Take the recent achievement in Tetris for example. You can see in the bias distribution that this was covered by more center and left organizations than right-leaning ones, with the Bias Insights tab showing you what each side chose to focus on. Sources are also rated by factuality, which isn't a fact check of a particular article, but an average score of the source based on two independent news monitoring organizations. You can even see where your own biases lie based on analytics about what articles you read and where you're consuming your news from. For those advanced features, you'll need a subscription, and using my promo code, you can go to ground.net news slash abisoft to get 30% off unlimited access to the Vantage plan using my link. I found their platform very useful in my own news browsing, and I'm sure you will too. And with that, let's get back to RNG manipulations in Sapphire. RNG in Sapphire is supposed to randomize the seed every time you perform a soft reset, but due to a bug, it instead starts from the same seed, which enables three manipulations to take place, Mudkip, Kyogre, and Wingle Manip. Wingle Manip is used to force an encounter and catch, with the Wingle having specific stats so it can one-shot a Geodude. To perform it, you need to save and soft reset, then press continue on a certain frame to get RNG on a known value, then follow a specific path. You'll know if you're on the right seed by checking the NPC movement, but there is another factor, 
and that's step count. As every 128 steps, the game has a 50% chance to advance the friendship mechanic, which will change your RNG, and coincidentally, this happens during Wingle Manip, so your step count matters. So what does this have to do with Jadiwi's run? When he's leaving Little Root Town, he walks straight up, which triggers Mom to walk over to you. This not only wastes time compared to talking to Mom yourself, but also alters the step count. This put his step count at minus 7 compared to the established route, meaning he had to make a correction on the fly to save the manip. Since he's on an odd number, this meant he needed to do one of the correcting steps in the door of the market, as it's the only place where a single step can be adjusted. Jadiwi doesn't do this however, and takes two steps above a ledge instead, resulting in a step count of minus 5. According to top runners, this spot isn't where you'd make a correction for Wingle Manip, so this was most likely a movement mistake. But a minus 5 step count still has a 50% chance of success, and the Manip works in Jadiwi's run. Later in the run is Kyogre Manip, very similar to Wingull as you soft reset, then use a timer to aid in catching a Kyogre with a first turn Great Ball, with this being considered the hardest manip in the run. Jadiwi also hit this manip on his first try, and we'll come back to why these two manips are significant, as well as look at the Mudkip manip in a bit, as there are three healing decisions he made that also raise red flags. Across the run, there are only five potions that you'll have access to, so health management and knowing when to use one are extremely important. But if we analyze Jadiwi's use of potions, we don't see the actions of someone with intimate knowledge of the run. Instead, we see someone that doesn't know what they're doing. In Petalburg Woods after the Wingle Manip, there's a Team Aqua member with a Poochiana that runners call the Aqua Pooch. Going into this fight, his Mudkip is at 19 of 25 HP, and he decides to use a potion to top it up. This decision makes no sense, as you're not in danger of dying in this fight unless you're at 13 HP. And any experienced runner knows this, but it's not even the only instance. On his way to the 5th gym, he heals his Marsh Top from 50 out of 81 before fighting the Delcaddy. The Delcaddy only has Double Slap as a damage move, which deals 6 per hit and if you're taking enough damage in this fight that you have to heal, you likely lost significant time to its non-damaging moves as well, which is a reset anyway. On top of this, it's more beneficial to heal before the next fight, as a Linoon can raise its attack and do significantly more damage. The most egregious heal, however, is at the end of the game, when he tops up his Kyogre from 64. The most damage that Steven Skarmory can do is 45 with its Aerial Ace, meaning the only thing to worry about is a crit. By healing here, he also changes the decision that Skarmory's AI can take, which opens him up to a potential turn stall. The crit is only a 3% chance, and what makes this worse is that he decided to heal while on world record pace. No top runner would play around the crit with world record on the line, and this decision puts his ability to be a second place runner in serious doubt, with the theory being that he topped up his HP to make it easier to splice in each instance. While a top runner wouldn't make the movement or healing mistakes that Jadiwi did, these are only circumstantial evidence and don't prove concretely that the run was cheated. But there's one more detail that Wave Warrior focused on, and that's Jadiwi's attempt count. If we look at the splits from his first run on November 13th, we see he has a total of 256 attempts, and when he achieved the second place time on the 17th, his attempt count went up to 1126, with these being the only runs he ever finished. That's 870 attempts over the course of 4 days, and he was called out about this in the Discord, with his response being that he played 14 hours a day. But let's analyze this. With a session time of 14 hours across 4 days, we get a total of 56 hours. Since there aren't any VODs of his attempts, we can't know for sure, but let's take his word and assume this is correct. The earliest reset point in the run is Mudkip Manip, as it occurs directly at the beginning. To execute it, you need to perform a soft reset, then use a timer to confirm the Mudkip on a certain frame to obtain the naughty nature with specific stats. You won't know if the Manip worked until the battle with the Poochina. If its gender is male, you were a frame early and have the wrong Mudkip. But if you're a frame late, the genders of both Pokemon and Mudkip's HP will be identical to the correct frame. The frame early reset is about 3 minutes and 20 seconds, with the frame late reset being closer to 5 minutes, as you need to play longer to verify the Mudkip. But let's be generous and assume that Jadiwi reset at the 3 minute 20 mark each time. 870 attempts resetting at the earliest possible Mudkip Manip gives a total minute count of 2900, or just over 40 
48 hours. This leaves 8 hours of time to perform any run that made it beyond Mudkip Manip, which equates to 4 full attempts that didn't die, with one of those resulting in a second place run. You can adjust the calculation in Jadiwi's favor a bit by accounting for attempts that reset before Mudkip Manip due to error. Wave Warrior offered 100 such attempts in his original calculation and attributed no reset penalty to them as well. Despite this, the time Jadiwi had for anything but Mudkip Manip only goes from just under 8 hours to a little over 13 hours, meaning he spent 43 madness-inducing hours grinding Mudkip Manips and only saw beyond the first 3 minutes of the game for a total of 13 hours, or 6.5 full runs of the game at record pace. This is not a lot of time, especially when you consider that the game is full of high-variance fights that can end a run, but Jadiwi is questioned about his attempt count and has this to say, 50% of my attempts did not pass Roxanne and 45 of the remaining 50% did not pass Tate and Lisa. Roxanne is the first gym leader, with the fight taking place just over 15 minutes into the run. Given that he has a huge attempt count, this is a clever thing to say, but as we saw with the math, it doesn't make any sense. Sapphire is a hard game to get a run going in given the various run killers, with top runners spending entire streams not getting anything beyond the mid game. And given that Jadiwi had a budget of 13 hours, the only conclusion is that at best, his attempt count is fake and at worst, the entire run is suspect. In a message to another runner, Jadiwi claims that he doesn't save any of his splits, and that he sets the attempt count by hand each time he starts a grind. It is possible he grinded 14 hours a day and put the attempt count in wrong but there's no way of verifying if this claim is true or false. If we go back to Mudkip Manip, we also see another glaring issue. Given that he would have spent 43 hours on this trick alone, it reveals another fact. Jadiwi is extremely inconsistent at performing manipulations. If Jadiwi is this bad at Mudkip Manip, then it's safe to say he's likely not great with Wingle Manip either. And assuming he talked to Mom and used the minus 5 step count in every attempt, only 3 of 6 frames on this step count produce a Wingle. This means he would have been failing the Manip 50% of the time even if he executed it properly. Kyogre Manip is likely harder to perform than the other two as well, especially with the added pressure of being on good pace, with each failed attempt costing 45 seconds. But Jadiwi hits this first try, despite spending over 40 hours resetting on Mudkip Manip. He also played on the DS console, which isn't hardware top runners prefer to play on as it's slightly slower than the Game Boy player for GameCube, resulting in final times that are about 10 seconds slower due to the frame rate difference meaning had he played this on the optimal hardware, it would have been world record by 5 seconds. None of this sat well with Wave Warrior, but since he couldn't find a splice or other definitive method of cheating, he kept this to himself. Fortunately, he only had to wait a month before more people became suspicious, as Jadiwi laid claim to the most prestigious record in all of Pokemon. The current red any% percent glitchless record was set on January 26th in 2023 and was the result of almost a decade of grinding by Pokeguy. Not only was Pokeguy's time monumental, but it beat the previous record by over a minute and came just 3 seconds away from what many believe to be the game's final minute barrier. His time was so good that a community member offered a $5,000 bounty for anyone that could beat it before February 1st, 2024, with an additional bounty of $1,000 being offered for anyone that set a 143. On Boxing Day 2023, Jadiwi would stream a run of any percent glitchless that beat the record by 11 seconds, but instead of being celebrated, it caused a wave of suspicion across the community. And if we look at his history with the category, we can start to see why. Looking at his grind between June 7th and 10th, he improved his PB by a minute each day. This is unusual, as it normally takes runners months to drop their time by a minute this close to the record, with PBs usually resulting in a gain of 10 to 20 seconds. For Jadiwi, the opposite was true. A gain of a few seconds was rare, with leaps of over a minute being a regular occurrence. And looking at his attempt count during June, we see his 147 came on his 119th run. Another anomaly, as most top runners near this time have an attempt count in the thousands. This rapid progression did raise some questions, but nobody suspected that he could be cheating. And when he resumed this category in September, it's worth noting that the only run he provided with video proof was the 147.52. He'd set a 4th place time that came 5 days after a record in blue no save corruption, and if we look at his attempt count, we see that it's now at 1230, with his last PB having a count of 851, meaning he did 371 attempts in the span of 5 days. This brings us to the record, and as soon as the final split was hit, Wave Warrior proof called Jadiwi in chat by asking him to hard reset the emulator to prove the run was done live and not pre-recorded. 
But instead, Jadiwi ended stream and went into the Pokemon Discord. He first posted a screenshot of his run with the caption, Getting lucky is not a crime. Then 10 minutes later, addressed the proof call. I just saw my chat on the replay. I didn't have it during the run. I just saw the hard reset requests. Now I'm sus. Sus indeed, as setting a record this prestigious after a week-long grind with thousands of dollars of bounties on the line, then dodging the proof call isn't exactly behavior the community expects. And with more than one person now doubting his accomplishments, an investigation was launched by the moderation team. Given that he didn't stream many of his attempts, the mods instead focused on three different pieces of evidence. His sum of best segments, his stream layout, and messages he had with the person issuing the bounties. If we look at his sum of best, we see that in his record, it's at 140.54. But in the 10 runs he streamed leading up to this, his sum of best was a 141.24. Between his 10th stream and the one where he got the record, there was a gap of 50 minutes. And top runners are in agreement that setting 30 seconds of gold splits in an offline attempt in this amount of time isn't possible. So what happened? When Jadiwi did stream, it wasn't always on Twitch, and looking at archives of deleted streams he did on YouTube, we see that a few days prior to December 21st, his sum of best steadily improved before arriving at a 140.54, the same number that was seen in his record. When questioned about this, he offered two explanations. Between the 21st and 22nd, he moved locations to his parents' house, and due to using a different computer, his splits file was out of date. The move itself isn't disputed, and on the surface, this appears to be a good explanation as to why his splits file rolled back for his attempts on Christmas and Boxing Day. But why did his sum of best change in the world record run? Jadiwi's answer to this is that in the 50 minutes between his 10th and 11th run, he went back through his VODs and added his correct gold splits so that his sum of bests would be correct. This claim seems dubious at best, since he could have done this before grinding any attempts at his new location. But if we analyze his stream layout, we can cast even more doubt on this claim. This is his stream layout for the 10 streams he did prior to the record, and this is the layout of his world record stream, which looks almost identical. Except when you lay it over his previous 10 streams, you see that his live split shifted a couple of pixels. People change their stream layout all the time, but making a minor adjustment like that between attempts is a bit odd. And if you compare the layout from his world record to a layout from his old location, you can see that they're an exact match. The only way this could have happened was if while he was editing his sum of bests between his 10th and 11th runs, he adjusted the live split layout to pixel perfectly match his layout from before the move. Given that he dodged a proof call, and the sum of best and layout from his record match a stream before he moved, the mods were of the opinion that he pre-recorded this run and passed it off as real during his Twitch livestream. They didn't have a smoking gun, however, as no splice or use of TAS had been found. But this was just the tip of the iceberg, and they shifted their focus to other records he had set. If we go back to the end of November, we see that Jadiwi was involved in three different races for Diamond and Pearl Any% percent Manipolis, where he set a 105.59 in the first race, and a 59.46 in the second. The 105 is a very good time for a race, but the 59.46 is very significant, as not only is it a world record, but it's also the first sub one hour time in the category's history. This was one of the first runs the team looked at after the investigation was launched, and there are a number of things wrong with it, so let's begin with an overview. The no manipulation category requires you to complete the first two gyms along with two Team Galactic encounters before an out of bounds glitch can be used to get you to the Hall of Fame cutscene. The run relies heavily on your starting Pokemon having good stats, with Chimchar being selected, but that's not all it needs. The powerhouse move of the run is hidden power, and in Gen 4, its type and power are determined by the user's IVs, which are just the values that determine a Pokemon's stats. Since you can't manipulate, this makes getting a good Chimchar a reset intensive endeavor, with a few different combinations of stats and hidden powers being viable, but the best type to get by far is Grass. Since you can't check your hidden power to see what stats it has, you need to test it in battle. And in Jadiwi's world record, we see that against the rival Starly, it wasn't very effective. But against the Piplup, it was super effective. This indicates that it's Grass-type, and given the high damage output, the base power is also high as well. 
At this point, he has a lead on the other racers, but even with a Grass-type hidden power, the recommended route is to get some extra experience before taking on the gym, but Jadiwi doesn't do this and heads straight for Roark. Leaving the extra XP on the table is a risk, and doesn't make much sense given that this was a race, but you could always say that Jadiwi stopped caring about the race and wanted to go for record given his great start so this isn't the most convincing evidence. When he finishes the run, he's beaten the previous world record by over a minute and a half, but given the investigation, it no longer passed the sniff test, so the mods investigated. This time, it would be Minnow that analyzed the run, and not finding anything on its face that was wrong, he broke out some tools that would help him identify the RNG seed of the run itself. Solving for the initial RNG seed of a diamond or pearl run isn't very difficult, as the seed is composed of three different variables. The first two digits are calculated by the calendar date and minute plus second value of the DS clock, with the third and fourth digits being calculated by the hour value. The final four are the number of frames since the game booted up, plus the last two digits of the year. The seed is generated the frame you clear of a TV cutscene, with the frame since boot being counted from the first white frame after doing a soft reset. But calculate Calculating Jadiwi's seed was difficult for two reasons. First, Minnow didn't know what year Jadiwi's DS clock was set to, but since it can only be a finite number, this just means that his calculation will involve a range of seeds rather than a single. And second, Jadiwi hid his DS clock from the video, choosing to have the calculator active instead. This is a strange decision, as most runners won't ever change this setting but fortunately, the clock is the default option when you receive the Pokatch. So there was an instance where the DS clock was active on Jadiwi's screen. This let Minnow get a range of seeds that only varied by the year variable, so he put them into a tool called Pokefinder, which lets you enter RNG seeds, and in turn, it spits out the frames that a certain Pokemon will appear on. This was only part of the equation, however, as he also needed the IVs of the Chimchar, which can be calculated by looking at its stat increases at level up. But in this case, Jadiwi was using a tool that displayed the stats on screen, so Minnow plugged them into Pokefinder along with the range of RNG seeds he calculated. And what do you think happened when he hit the Find button? The Chimchar that Jadiwi used did not appear in any of the RNG seeds, a clear indicator that the run had been spliced. This wasn't the only RNG analysis that Minnow performed, however, as the trainer ID that appears when you enter the Hall of Fame is also tied to the seed. When he reverse engineered the seed from the trainer ID, the specific ID appeared in a handful of seeds, but only one of these can occur when the DS clock is at hour 1, which we know was Jadiwi's clock time if we look at when he received the Pokatch and subtract his run time. This seed has a slightly higher delay than was expected of Jadiwi's run given that Minnow frame counted what his delay should be, and if we look at the Chimchar that the trainer ID seed can generate, the hidden power grass with a hasty nature isn't one of them. That makes two pieces of conclusive evidence that the run was cheated, but Minnow took it a step further and injected the trainer ID seed into a run. The point of this was so he could compare NPC movement between the seed observed at the start and the seed generated from his trainer ID, as NPCs will always move the same on a given RNG seed. In Jadiwi's run, we see that the NPC outside of Mom's house starts facing left, then looks up, but on the trainer ID seed, the NPC starts looking right, then switches to left, then looks up. This proves that his trainer ID doesn't match the seed in the beginning, and that even if this was the correct trainer ID, the Chimchar doesn't exist on this seed, or the seed observed at the start. This was the smoking gun the mods were looking for, and before we move on to his other runs, let's look at some of his behavior around this one. On November 30th, after he set the 105, he went into Sin's chat and said he should try for a sub-hour time. As we know now, he achieved the feat the very next day with his fake run, so he was foreshadowing his own accomplishment in another runner's chat, then returned to gloat after he successfully passed off the fake run. I spoke to some of the runners involved in the race as part of my own investigation and asked them who organized the three races, and in each case, it was Jadiwi who organized them, showing that not only did he fake a run, but he calculated the when and where of how he would show it off. One of them even says that looking back, his tone of voice during the run doesn't sound authentic, which lines up completely given that we know the run was pre-recorded, and to help hide this fact, he made tapping sounds on his DS during the race to make it seem like he wasn't playing a recording. Jadiwi had a previous record in this category as well, and he even points out that the time difference between them was almost identical, but I guess that's not hard to accomplish when you're faking runs and setting up races to pass them off as legit. 
but this Pearl run was just the beginning. If we look at Jadiwi's timeline since he started speedrunning, we see that he began with Pearl, then moved on to various categories in Gen 1, with his first record coming in Red Any% percent, a run of pure execution that uses save corruption to credits warp. He had posted some times with video proof prior to this record, so it didn't raise any suspicion. A lot of his runs between August and early October did not have video proof, but that would change after he finished running gold, as he started setting records very quickly. Most of them were in short categories he was considered good at, so they didn't raise many eyebrows. But no save corruption is a different story. At the time when it was performed, it was generally believed to be a legitimate, but insanely lucky run. However, once the investigation started, some serious doubt was cast on its legitimacy. The run is a mix of RNG and execution, as you need to play to Viridian Forest before you can activate the credits warp glitch which requires the rival fight and going through the tall grass on Route 1 three times. For the rival fight, the fastest thing that can happen is for the Squirtle to use Tackle five times to KO your Charmander, with it having about a 50% chance to select Tackle over Tail Whip. This equates to about a 3% chance of getting the optimal RNG, with some edge cases bumping the odds up a bit, but they're still low. When it comes to the tall grass, you need to pass through 41 tiles of it, with each tile having a tile value of 25. To decide if you get an encounter, the game rolls a number between 0 and 255, with an encounter being generated if the number rolled is less than the tile number. This gives odds of about 2% for zero encounters, with combined odds of about 5% to get that and a good Squirtle fight, and this RNG is required for any potential world records. After that, you need to manipulate a Spiro catch as it's a better Pokemon than Charmander for clearing the trainers in the forest. Once you have Spiro, you're now ready for the most difficult manipulation in all of Pokemon speedrunning. It involves manipulating zero encounters in the forest so you can trigger a Pikachu fight as you enter a trainer's line of sight. This gets the game in a state where your actions now edit the code itself, which is known as Arbitrary Code Execution, or ACE. The manipulation doesn't end at the Pikachu, however. A runner named Grogear developed it so that you carry it through two more bug catcher fights, with the requirements being frame-perfect inputs and short windows to clear text boxes, which leaves a lot of spots for mistakes across the two-minute manipulation. In Jadiwi's run, not only did he get a five-turn death with the rival, but he also had zero encounters before the Spiro Manip. And when it came time to execute Grogear's new Manip, not only did he perform it, but he also got two unmanipulated crits on the final two bug catcher fights. When Grogear first developed the extended manipulation, it took him weeks to get a below average consistency with it. But if we look at Jadiwi's proficiency with a comparable manip, we don't see much reason to be confident in his abilities. The triple extended manip in Red Glitchless requires you to manipulate a Nidoran encounter and catch continue it into a Pidgey encounter and catch, then extend it into a zero encounter forest until you fight the bug catcher, where you force one final event by having its Weedle use String Shot. It's agreed by top runners that while this manip is hard, Grogear's in the no save corruption category is harder. And when it came to Jadiwi's execution at the triple extended, we see that he often dropped it at the Pidgey catch, as happened in his 143. This doesn't mean he can't execute the harder manip, but it does cast doubt on his ability to be able to hit it while under the pressure of finally getting the 5 turn death and 0 encounter start. A further problem is that by Jadiwi's own admission, he only had 5 or 6 runs that were 5 turn 0 encounters, but that he failed the extended manip in all of them meaning the only run he had beyond the Manip was this one. After the Manip, there are still some actions you need to take, and Jadiwi proceeded to get the best RNG possible with two unmanipulated crits, the faster of two possible fights, a fast bug catcher dialogue, and a non-crash ace warp with the combined odds of these events being 1 in 800. You may have noticed a pattern developing where Jadiwi always finishes a run if he gets a good start, with there only being a handful of examples where he posted screenshots of dead runs. And this wasn't lost on the mods as they carried out the investigation. While they couldn't find a splice, they did acknowledge that despite every world record in Pokemon requiring exceptional luck, Jadiwi rarely spent more than a week grinding any category before achieving a record. And in this run, the single attempt he managed managed to get through the manipulation received the best luck possible, with their verdict being that it was likely achieved through illegitimate means. There's also the Red Glitchless Classic record he set on November 21st, just four days after his second place time in Sapphire. When he last ran the category, his attempt count was 164, 
and the earliest he could have started this grind was midday on the 17th. When he got the record, his attempt count was 622, meaning across three and a half days, he did 458 attempts. If we run a calculation and assume he played 14 hours a day as he claimed in Sapphire, we see that he was averaging 7 minutes per attempt, which doesn't make a lot of sense, as most runs in this category are getting to Brock, which is at the 11 minute mark. This run also didn't have any identifiable splices in it, but given all of the other evidence, this run's legitimacy was also doubted by the mods. And not wanting to alarm Jadiwi in case he tried to hide evidence, they didn't inform him of this investigation when it started. Along with analyzing his runs, they also gathered gathered statements he made in Discord and various Twitch chats, and one that consistently appeared was Jadiwi claiming he didn't lose runs in the late game because he was better at execution and handling pressure. He says that if you gave his RNG to other runners, they wouldn't be able to execute, then complains about people calling him lucky when he sets a record, but congratulate others when they do. But getting called lucky shouldn't have surprised him, given that he finished his best pace ever every single time he got it. After his 145 in Glitchless, he acknowledges that other players who have spent more time grinding than him and have worse times are better runners than he is. It's almost as if he's telling on himself, and then goes on to say that if he wins the $1,000 bounty, he would give half to two different runners. He's asked at one point why he doesn't upload any of his runs to the leaderboard, with Jadiwi replying that he doesn't have a Game Boy player and can't run on emulator because his computer sucks. Which brings up another point. When Jadiwi wasn't streaming attempts, he never locally recorded any of his runs. Pokemon Red is not a CPU-intensive game to stream, let alone record. In fact, it could be ran on a TI-84 calculator that uses a processor from 1974. And one member of the community even plays and records attempts on a Lenovo T420 a PC pad that's 13 years old. The first Game Boy emulator, released in 96, and one of the first screen recording softwares, Fraps, released in 99. Fraps doesn't require much processing power by today's standards, and its 3.0 version has min specs of a Pentium 4 processor, which is hardware available in the year 2000. Given this, the fact that he didn't record runs and made excuses for why he couldn't makes zero sense, as a PC that's older than he is can perform the required operations without over heating or maxing out on memory. Given the hard evidence in Pearl, the mountain of evidence from Sapphire and other games, and all of these statements, the mods were confident in their investigation and were ready to move forward with their decision. But before they could, Jadiwi posted that he was retiring from speedrunning. He cites an increasing school schedule as the main reason as he won't have time to do 14 hour a day grinds anymore, and says that with the free time he does have, he will be focusing on speed cubing, which is solving Rubik's cubes incredibly fast. On top of this, he's out of shorter categories to run, as he doesn't have the mental strength to do longer runs and needs breaks every two hours. Which seems odd, given that he would spend 14 hours a day grinding according to his own statements. He then goes into a story about how he was bullied as a child due to a medical condition. I'm not going to dispute this or go into it beyond highlighting that he cites these experiences as to why he didn't stream much during his grinds. He ends with a final shot at another runner, then rides off into the sunset or so everyone thought. Because the next day, the mods informed him that as a result of their investigation, he had been banned from the Discord and leaderboards. Not informing him about the investigation was a smart move, because immediately after this, he began deleting Discord messages and videos. But luckily, the mods had already backed up everything. He replies to this message the next morning, stating he would wait for the report to be released before commenting. But just two hours later, he released another paste bin. It opens with, GG, quite impressed with the effort to find out how I cheated, and goes into why he cheated his first run, which was the blue no save corruption, claiming he did perform 3000 attempts, but became frustrated he couldn't get the record. He admits to using save states to splice the run together, then says that he didn't cheat for bounties and that he felt terrible about cheating and didn't like lying to people. But when he saw the run wasn't scrutinized, he decided to cheat more as he wanted to make the most of his remaining time speedrunning. He admits to Sapphire, Red Classic, and Red Glitchless being cheated, and even claims to have had a save state ready in case he was proof called for the 143, then offers a single apology and claims again that he didn't care about the bounties, and had he received them, he would have given half to the runners he promised to distribute the 1000 $1,000 bounty to, and that the other 7500 would have been given to his parents. This statement is absolutely ludicrous and should be reason enough to doubt anything he said, as it's contradicted in the very pastebin itself. 
If he didn't cheat for the bounties, then why cheat the runs that award you the bounties in the first place? And more importantly, he didn't say that he would have refused the money, but instead claims he would have taken it and given it to other runners and his parents. If he didn't care about the bounties, then why message one of the bounty posters asking if you can stream the runs on Discord instead of on Twitch? This is in direct conflict with his pace bin, since why would you ask if you can claim a bounty if you didn't care about them? Never mind asking to stream your runs in a less public method. Interestingly enough, he never admitted to cheating the Pearl Run, despite that one having direct hard evidence, nor did he admit to the red or yellow any percent runs being cheated. Likely because of the time of the mods informing him of the ban, they hadn't released the report, so Jadiwi didn't actually know what they had caught and what they hadn't. After his pace bin, he did admit to using save states to splice the Pearl Run together, and you might be wondering how no splices were able to be detected. And the answer is that Jadiwi is very familiar with video editing software. He had other YouTube channels where he created music, Photoshop tutorials, and edited challenge videos around Pokemon. The challenge video channel has since been scrubbed, but using the Wayback Machine, you can see that it did have content at one point. So the answer to how he was able to splice undetected is that he was very skilled at using equipment that can create spliced runs. And with the Pearl Run in particular, he claimed claims he did it on a flash cart, which has faster load times than the DS. If you look at the loads in the video, however, they are about the same as you'd expect on a DS, meaning he accounted for this discrepancy when splicing the run. This also defeats his earlier claim of not being able to locally record because of his PC being potato quality, as any computer that can run editing software certainly has the capacity to run an emulator with recording software. All of this goes to show the lengths he went through not to get caught, so the mods deserve congratulations in catching this before he was able to claim bounties, as while getting lucky may not be a crime, succeeding in stealing almost $10,000 with fake videos almost certainly is. And who knows, maybe I'll be making a video on a speed tubing cheater later this year. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to support me on Patreon or become a member here on YouTube.